The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Addressing Healthcare Disparities and Optimizing Patient Outcomes in Atopic Dermatitis and Alopecia Areata. Expert insight on how to improve access and quality of care. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash TJZ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Let's begin by talking about atopic dermatitis. This is an incredibly common chronic inflammatory disease. It affects an awful lot of people, up to 20% of children, and maybe as high as 10% of adults in developed countries. No matter how you count the numbers, it results in massive suffering for both the patient and the family. And frankly, beyond that, there's a rippling effect outward on school and work and society and even clinicians. It has been a really interesting journey trying to understand the pathogenesis of this disease. And I think we are refining that concept. It's getting better and better. The most current ideas really all hover around this idea that there is a barrier damage component, an inflammatory component, a sensory nerve alteration, and the microbiome that is in a dysbiotic state. All of these play off each other, and we've finally been able to identify a number of key cytokines that play an important role in driving this whole process. That would include things like IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, but there are many others that are involved, particularly at later stages of the disease. One thing that often does not get discussed directly is the behavioral aspect as well. And I think that is important. Sometimes I will see, particularly my adolescent patients, they'll start scratching when we're talking about something and they seem anxious. And I'll ask them, are you actually itchy? And they'll say, no, I'm just doing it out of habit. So that might be sort of the secret fifth component to this whole disease that does play a role for some more than others. No matter how finely we slice the pathophysiologic understanding, it turns out that this is probably not one disease. The answer is not going to be the same for everyone. And we're really at the beginning of this journey into understanding some of the endotypes and biomarkers that are going to help us differentiate on a personalized or precision level. And I'm really excited about that, not only with immune polarization features, but also epidermal barrier markers. One day, perhaps like the sci-fi tricorder, we're going to be able to look at an individual patient to analyze their skin and immune system and to be able to say, the particular problem is this. And because of that, we know exactly how to treat it perfectly, but we have a ways to go. In the meantime, we are in a relative stone age with atopic dermatitis. Diagnosis of this disease lacks a gold standard test. In fact, many patients will often say, isn't there something you can do, some kind of a blood test or a biopsy to prove it? And the answer is we really can't. It ends up being somewhat vague. And what we still use to this very day, including in clinical trials, are simply diagnostic features that help us put it into a category. And these are loosely based on the original work of Drs. Hannafin and Rika. So these have been around for quite some time, and they really are three in number. The first is that it has to be itchy. That pruritus is really an essential feature of this disease. The second is that we have the eczematous eruption. Now, this is heterogeneous. It can be acute, subacute, or chronic. And there are lots of different morphologies from lichenified, thick and leathery, to open, eroded, and oozing, and everything in between. But overarchingly, there has to be this typical morphology and the age-specific distribution pattern. So for example, in babies, we're often seeing it on the cheeks. In children, we see that more classical flexural involvement. And in adults, it tends to be more acral, hands and feet, but also head and neck as well. And then finally, it has to be chronic or relapsing by history. That's really all you need, those three features. So I think while it is very sensitive for picking up this disease, it does lack some selectivity. And a big part of my job especially when I'm seeing a new patient who's been refractory, is making sure I've thought carefully about the differential diagnosis and make sure I'm excluding those must-not-miss mimics of atopic dermatitis. These include everything from scabies infestation. I've really seen it. It's gone on for years in some patients, undiscovered seborrheic dermatitis. Sometimes, especially in our pediatric patients, they can have seborrheic dermatitis and or psoriasis overlapping their atopic dermatitis. Contact dermatitis can both mimic and be a second comorbid problem with atopic dermatitis. And that drives us crazy. We can see true allergic contact dermatitis as one of the triggers or one component of it. But even when we remove those allergens, 
Sometimes they really do have underlying atopic dermatitis, but it can also be a true mimic. So that's part of our job. And then other things like cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, photosensitivity dermatoses, and of course, other immunodeficiencies and erythrodermas. So there is quite a bit of work to do, especially when it's not behaving as you might expect. There are some images we can look at to help us see some of these things in our differential, like a beautiful contact dermatitis to nickel in the belt buckle here. We see very much an eczematous eruption. Here we have erythema. We have some of the honey-colored crusting. It's probably secondarily infected with staph, and we see lots of lichenification in the periphery. This has been a chronic problem. Another example, very similar, this one's less oozy and open and probably not infected at this point, but again, lots of inflammation and papulation. Here's an older patient that had been diagnosed with atopic dermatitis for quite some time, and it turns out on biopsy, finally, this did reveal itself to be cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, which really can mimic atopic dermatitis and can take a long time to diagnose. It really is not anybody's error necessarily. It just can be sort of an indolent process, slowly heading towards the proper criteria. Sometimes babies can have complicated presentations. This initially started out as something like a diaper dermatitis, but then became a more widespread eczematous dermatitis that wasn't responding to topical steroids. It turns out this was zinc deficiency. So we would classify this as acrodermatitis and teropathic alike eruption. This baby was actually getting insufficient zinc in total parenteral nutrition. So that was able to quickly turn around with the addition of zinc, but it really does look quite eczematous. Another relatively uncommon but still important diagnostic consideration is the pityriasis lichenoides chronica or PLC. So pityriasis lichenoides chronica often presents as erythematous papules, sometimes can look a little bit of eczematous, and we can often see hypopigmented or even truly depigmented patches left over that can be confusing, especially when we're thinking about entities like pityriasis alba. Scabies infestation definitely makes an eczematous eruption, and we can actually do a scraping and look under the microscope for one of the three signs, the ova, the parasite itself, and the cybala or scabies feces, which we can see. So the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis has to be itchy, has to be the characteristic eczematous pattern, and it has to be chronic or relapsing. But in some of those cases where there's a question, we often will do a workup to help us exclude some of the things we've mentioned. And that workup can include a skin biopsy, although admittedly it can be difficult to know exactly if we can tell because it may take years. We also can do patch testing to try to figure out if there is an allergic contact that's driving this. Now, food allergy testing is generally not very helpful for these patients. And the confusing thing, of course, is that food allergies are really looking for an IgE-mediated allergy. There's no doubt that there's a connection. Many people with particularly moderate and severe atopic dermatitis have concomitant food allergy, but that's usually not driving the disease, although I never say never. So many of my patients have had extensive food allergy workup and usually are already avoiding a number of foods. And occasionally, there's no doubt there are cases where people say, gosh, as soon as I cut food X, Y, or Z, I was much better or even cured. Although I would push back. If you told me that it was a single food driving all of your skin problems, I would actually say then definitionally, you do not have atopic dermatitis. You had an eczematous food eruption and that's actually a different disease. And that's great because if that's all you need to do, then you actually don't even belong here and you're good to go. Go and do good things into the world and, and uh, have a great life. Don't worry about this anymore. But for our true atopic dermatitis patients, by definition, it would not just be a food or foods. That would just be one of many potential triggers. And there's no doubt there's actually a lot of debate on the proper approach to food allergy testing, not only from peer to peer, but especially when we look at an organizational level. And a few years ago, we put together a paper comparing the American Academy of Dermatology guidelines with those of the Joint Task Force and of Allergy Immunology. Now, both of these guidelines are quite dated now. They're both currently being updated and rewritten, but there really are different thresholds for testing. And as you might imagine, the allergists are a little bit more bullish in terms of food allergy testing whereas the dermatologist might be a little bit more circumspect. The truth is probably that it's best to really look at an individual patient and have the discussion with them. In general, testing for allergies is not a bad idea, but where it gets problematic is when people start doing empiric food exclusion. They'll start removing things from the diet. Now, historically, people would say, well, what does it matter? Why not cut out gluten or dairy? Those are the two most common things by far that people talk about, but maybe there's a particular food that they've identified. Maybe it's strawberries, maybe it's nightshades, something like that. So if they feel that's important, why not just take it out? 
Well, Dr. Anne Marie Singh and colleagues just a few years ago wrote a very compelling and frankly provocative paper where they looked at about 300 patients who had previously tolerated foods, but in an effort to treat their eczema, they excluded them because maybe some testing or they suspected that it could be worsening it. Now, here's what they found. So they were previously tolerating them with the exception possibly of eczema getting a little bit worse, but no hives, no true allergy to them. When they put those foods back in the diet after they concluded, you know, this really wasn't driving my eczema, 19% of them, so almost one in five, had symptoms of acute IgE reactions. And of those, nearly a third were classified as anaphylaxis. This is a big deal. And what this suggests is that taking foods out of your diet can cause you to lose your tolerance of these foods. And this actually is really dangerous. And in a way, it makes me think that in doing this, we've made our worst fear become a reality. We were afraid of being allergic to the food, so we got rid of eating it. And now we truly are allergic in a dangerous way, anaphylaxis type way, or to carryal type way. And this is very different. So I think we're now seeing things turn around that maybe just eliminating things from the diet is not such a great idea. And when people push back on me, I start to bring up the complexity of the food reactions that we're talking about. Because in many publications, people do not give proper focus and attention to the fact that this is not one thing. It's not a monolith of food reactions. There's so many different aspects of this, from the true IgE-mediated food allergies that we're talking about there, to more functional intolerances, things like lactose intolerance, to food sensitivity, which can be a vague and a little bit more nebulous of a category, but does have some real connections in there, to contact dermatitis to a food. And this is something we'll see Little kids, when they're eating, they get food all over their cheeks. So sometimes they actually are just reacting to the food touching their cheeks. They're not really allergic in a systemic sense. And sometimes it's even just an irritant type dermatitis, for example, from citrus fruits or tomatoes. We know also that there are some just inflammatory foods in the diet. Now, this is very nonspecific, but for some people eating a lot of processed foods, sugary foods, dairy products for some people, they just seem to drive inflammation in a, in a less specific manner. And this is really important. I think this may explain why sometimes more extreme diets do seem to work. You know, people get told, hey, I want you to change your diet. I want you to cut out all of these foods. And sometimes inadvertently, that means suddenly they're eating much more healthy. Now, I think you'd be crazy to argue with anyone that eating healthy isn't important to good health. It is. It's critical. So sometimes I think that people get better because they've changed their diet for maybe the wrong reasons, you know, thinking they were allergic to something, but they got the right answer. So, you know, I call this the right answer, wrong reason. They got to the right place, even though they didn't necessarily know why they were going there. And I think that's something we need to look at more and need to understand better. Of course, then we have much more specific diseases like celiac disease, where the gluten molecule really is causing a particular immune response. This can be very serious for some patients. And then some of the newer entities like eosinophilic esophagitis, very strange and definitely seems much more food related than atopic dermatitis. So I say this with great humility. There is a lot to learn here, but anybody saying that it's easy or clear, I think that means they either are being disingenuous or they don't actually understand the complexity of this area. We hear about many different treatments for different levels of disease severity. Some treatments are indicated for mild to moderate disease. Others, the systemic agents, are often indicated for moderate to severe disease. So it seems like it should be a straightforward question. It's something we just accept as part of the diagnosis of the disease. But it turns out that figuring out the severity of atopic dermatitis is actually a rather difficult problem. It's difficult in part because it is a dynamic disease that has a number of different axes, right? We have what we see on the skin the sort of the exam findings, but we also have what the patient is feeling, not only their itch, but also we now know that many patients experience skin pain. Then we have the quality of life impacts. And all of this is against a backdrop of this dynamic waxing and waning pattern. So on any given day, it can be very difficult to say what the severity of the disease is. Somebody comes into your office and we talk about this as the mechanics problem, right? You have your car is making a funny noise. You bring it to the mechanic. The mechanic says, I don't hear anything now. And you say, no, I swear, it's been making this rattle for two months. And the day I bring it in, it's quiet. Well, our patients often say the same thing. When I called you a month ago or two weeks ago, I was miserable. I wasn't sleeping. My skin was a mess. And now I'm a bit better. So I know I look okay today, but please, please listen to me. You know, I'm really miserable. So what do you say? What is their severity? And especially when we think about some of the different patterns that patients can elicit. Sometimes it's a lot of ups and downs. Sometimes it's a seasonal flare-up. They're pretty good for most of the year, but maybe in the dead of winter or for some people in the heat of summer when they're sweaty and hot. We can see these different aspects. 
I think our goal is to get a more holistic understanding of their skin. And the overarching goal is to bring those flare ups down and get them under control in a longitudinal setting. And this is based on some of the work of the beautiful Asia Pacific guidelines. Now, these are a few years old now. These were published back in 2013, but I still think this concept is more timely than ever. In fact, I think they were kind of prescient about this, that instead of talking about a flare control only, we need to be thinking about how to get a more long-term control and get the disease, what I call the damping pattern, where it's less, 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 and greater intervals between flare-ups. And this is hard to do. It's, it's one thing to treat a flare. There's lots of things we can do, and it's sort of straightforward. It's much more complicated to design a plan that can help keep things clear for months and even years, right? Our goal is to keep people clear going forward. So all of this pushes us to figure out how to assess this disease. And there, unfortunately, is a huge smorgasbord of different options from the EASY score, the POEM score, the SCORAD, the PO SCORAD, Dermatology Life Quality Indices, itch scores. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So many of them are validated. In fact, the top ones all are validated here. And they're useful in clinical trials, but many of these can be difficult in a clinical setting. So what can we do? I think there's a couple that are worth thinking about. The first one is the IGA score, the Investigator Global Assessment. More recently, it's sort of been validated and rebranded as the VIGAAD, so the Validated IGA for Atopic Dermatitis, but it really is the same basic score. It's a five-point scale, zero, one, two, three, and four. And it's very straightforward. The clinician makes this designation. You can do it in one second, you know, when you see the patient, as long as you can see most of their skin, you can give them a clear, almost clear, mild, moderate, or severe rating. Now, it's great because it's very fast, but it fails on a couple of levels. First of all, it's a point in time. So again, it's the mechanics problem all over again. If they look almost clear that day, you know, when you give them an IJ score of one, well, now if you send that to an insurance company, they're going to say, well, this patient's fine. They don't need any of these bigger medicines. But what if they were a severe two weeks ago? So we have a temporal aspect. The other aspect is that it's pretty digital. It's pretty crude. Five, five different points, that's it. So if somebody's severe, fine. What if they're twice as bad as that patient? Are they super duper severe? Well, not by this scale. They're just severe. So there's a ceiling effect. And then the last piece is that, yeah, there's not a lot of analog degrees to go. So again, within severe, you might have someone who's a lot better, but they still count as a severe. So it's impossible to see smaller changes within a category. So lots of limitations, but something that I do for every single patient because it takes one second. It's sort of what we do in that moment. But knowing those caveats, I think makes it more useful to say, well, today they looked this way. And that's really all you can say. There are some better tools out there. One of my favorite tools is called the PO Scorad. This is the patient-oriented Scorad. I love this because there's a little app. It's all free, of course. It's non-sponsored, non-branded. And this is really neat because it also takes into account different skin types. So right now, far from perfect, but definitely better than not having any. There are three different skin types and they're categorized as Caucasian, Asian, and Black. And what's really nice is that patients could try to find the closest skin type to these pictures to give them some sense of something a little closer to what they might actually be seeing on the skin. Now, these have all been validated and tested. And what I love about this is the patient does it themselves. So it's internally consistent with the patient and it kind of takes the burden off of the clinician. The patient can do this and follow along. It's very easy for the patient to do, but it does take a few minutes. It's not, it's not one second. They have to go through a couple of aspects. The other nice thing that's great about the PO score ad is that it also asks questions about sleep and symptoms. So it's a much more holistic capturing of what's going on with their disease state. It's one of my favorites, although it is a little bit cumbersome. Even easier than those, though, is the POEM score. And this stands for the patient-oriented eczema measure. It's fabulous. It is seven questions. It takes about one minute to ask, and it has 28 different points that you can put together from zero to 28. And what's remarkable about this is it captures so many aspects of the disease, including it asks about sleep and itch and overall quality of life. And I think this is really fantastic. It captures those concepts very, very well. So I like this scale a lot. Now, in clinical trials, we will see other things used. In the US in particular, we'll often see the easy score. European centric trials will often use SCORAD. So I do think they're important and they probably won't disappear, but they're not the greatest thing for us to incorporate into our own private practices or in, in a clinical setting. The other interesting piece that came about recently, and this this is some of the work of Dr. Amy Paller and Dr. Jonathan Silverberg and others put together this idea of having a cross product of two different easy indicators, one being that IGA score we talked about, investigator global assessment, so clear, almost clear, mild, moderate, or severe, and then multiplying that with the body surface area. 
There's a similar system in psoriasis that's used. And unlike those five point scale of IgA, now we have a 400 point scale. And they actually did some really neat work showing that it correlates pretty well to the eczema area and severity index, one of those more cumbersome clinical trial tools. So I think it's kind of fascinating. And it's, again, very easy to do. And I do both of these anyways in my patients because I always put that IgA score and I always estimate a body surface area. So this is another thing that potentially could be used, especially again, for the clinical presentation. Now, mind you, this doesn't capture itch. It doesn't capture quality of life. It doesn't capture sleep. And that's why I think something like the POEM score and that ADCT, the atopic dermatitis control tool can be so useful because they really do capture them. Oh, and I, I wanted to mention as well, the POEM score and the ADCT are also unique because they ask about how the patient's been doing in the last week. So they have a temporal aspect that again is greater than this point in time uh, that we see with these indices. So we have some examples of some cases just to kind of see what this might look like. Here's a young patient who is pretty severe. They have about a 60% body surface area. When we look at our IgA score, clearly they have lots of marked lichenification. So this would be a four on the IgA score and a 60% body surface area. So that cross product puts them at about 240. Here's another patient with about 90% body surface area. Again, this patient is a four uh, because they have lots of deep red erythema and they have oozing and crusting. So they would be up at a 360. And I really like this because you get a sense that last patient was pretty bad, but this one is even worse. Whereas if they were both IgA, they would both be fours. You couldn't differentiate between these two patients with an IgA score. But when we add this BSA, we really get a little bit more complexity. Now a score adder easy score would also capture this beautifully, but they're much more clunky. So I really like this example. It shows us the ceiling effect and the dangers of just using one type of scale for these patients. It can be very misleading. More recently, I've been using the ADCT, the atopic dermatitis control tool. It beats the POEM score in that it's six questions instead of seven. So it's just even shorter. And it takes, I kid you not, about 45 seconds to run through the questions in clinic and gives them a very similar score. So either one of these, I think, would be best practices. They take just a couple of seconds. And ideally, the patient could even fill this out before you enter the room. So I started getting into the habit. I was doing POEM and now I'm doing the ADCT because I think it's even a little bit more refined. It's one page, both sides. The front side is the questions. The back actually has information for the patients and I let them take it home. I just write down their score on their chart. So I say today their, you know, their ADCT score was 17 and it's, it's fantastic. So we can really follow along and see how they're doing. Another really important area that, again, these types of scales don't even touch upon are the comorbidities. We know that there are lots of different comorbidities associated with atopic dermatitis, both in adults and children. And I think we are now more than ever looking at these associations carefully. Of course, we have both atopic comorbidities, things like food allergy, asthma, allergic conjunctivitis, hay fever, you know, rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps. These are known for a long time, but now there are some non-allergic or non-atopic comorbidities that we're beginning to identify. And these include things like cardiovascular disease, uh, hypertension, myocardial infarction, stroke, bone fractures. There are a number of things. And of course, there are a number of psychological issues from anxiety, depression, and other things. So I think we need to spend more time and energy understanding this. And I'm firmly in the camp, admittedly, this is speculative what I'm saying here, but I'm firmly in the camp that if we get good disease control, particularly from an early point, I truly believe we can mitigate against some of these comorbidities, including things like food allergy. So sometimes when I have a family who is very treatment averse or very anxious or hesitant, I will say, you know, the truth is we have to weigh the risks of treatment along with the risks of not treating the disease, right? Because if we're not treating this appropriately, it is very likely not only to cause trouble itself, the, the pain, the itch, the sleep issues, the all of the impact on quality of life, but also it may have some downstream effects that are really difficult and unwanted and may be very hard to stop once they're there. Now, our goal is still to use as little medicine as possible. I mean, frankly, to avoid medicine whenever we can. And when we need it, to use as little as possible to keep the patient happy, comfortable, and clear. And then talk about the three great hurdles of treating this disease. The first hurdle is, can I get you clear in the first place? Usually, I can. That's usually not a huge problem. The second hurdle is much more daunting. Can I keep you clear safely? That's about where 90% of my referrals come in. You know, they can clear up with intensive topical therapy or with oral prednisolone or something. Sure, you know, that clears them, but they can't stay clear safely. And then the third hurdle 
is can they keep it up? And that's a little bit more of a holistic concept. It includes things like their mental well-being. It includes things like access to medications, lifestyle issues. And that can be a deal breaker for somewhere. They say, you know, I'm doing this complicated regimen and it is keeping me clear safely, but I'm going crazy. All my clothes are ruined. There's ointments everywhere. I feel like I can't travel. I need a change. So all three of those points I think are critical. And a really nice way to do this was written up in 2018, Mark Boganiewicz and others in this yardstick management, this stepwise approach to thinking about atopic dermatitis, climbing this therapeutic ladder. Now, this is a little bit dated because there've been several new therapies, but I think the approach, the philosophy is perfect and it's still more than ever relevant today. The beginning is really basic management. We want gentle skincare, good moisturization, mild cleansers, avoiding known triggers. If things bother your skin, you know, certain allergens or irritants, by all means, please don't do that. So very practical. And there's no doubt for some people, for the mildest patients, most of us will never see these patients. Thankfully, they don't need us, but that might be all they need. Just good, general, practical advice. So you know what? My skin was bothering me. Now I'm better. If that's not enough, then we move up to that mild category. Here we might start using during an inflamed aspect, we might start using a topical corticosteroid. Now we could talk a long time about why we pick steroids as the first line, but I would say really there's three key pieces why they hold that first line defense. Number one, they are very accessible, right? They're super inexpensive. Most patients can get them within the same day. We don't have to do complex prior auths or send away or do all these things. Number two, they are incredibly reliable. Almost every single patient I treat with a topical steroid is going to get at least some improvement from it. It's remarkable. It really is. It's such a broad medicine that it really helps almost everybody. And number three, they are pretty safe when used in very short term. So they really meet the criteria for why they, they hold this position, although many of my patients hate them. And many, there's kind of a growing movement. Many patients feel that this is not a good choice for many conditions and that they really want to avoid them altogether or at least absolutely minimize them. But I truly believe that for the vast majority of patients, using a low to mid-potency topical steroid twice a day for a few days up to a week really should get them under control. And then we take a break. Now, if we can't, keep under control with that. You know, so sometimes patients come back and say, hey, that worked. But as soon as I stopped, it flared right back up. So what should I do? Should I go right back on it? Well, no, because we don't want people on continuous or nearly continuous topical corticosteroids. They have a whole host of side effects that start to come up. Everything from skin thinning and atrophy to true stria to systemic absorption, particularly in smaller patients. And then maybe the more controversial, but I truly think there's something to it, even though I know it's an unpopular opinion. Oh, I, think, I think the tides are changing. We're seeing more and more people acknowledge it. This kind of topical steroid addiction withdrawal, sometimes abbreviated as TSW, topical steroid withdrawal. And admittedly, we don't have a gold standard diagnosis admittedly, it's probably not always applied correctly. It's over applied. But I truly do believe some patients have a funny response to overuse of corticosteroids. So what if it's not enough? Well, then we go up to our moderate and then we really get this wonderful idea. And, and many people have talked about it over the years, but I, I really have to give credit to Professor Andreas Wollenberg in Munich, who wrote a beautiful paper really studying this a few years ago, where we have the concept of maintenance therapy. So we might use our topical steroids for a bit, a few days, a week, maybe two weeks get things better. And then instead of going back to nothing, we would switch on to, to maintain something that's ideally non-steroidal. And this could be what Professor Volenberg studied was tacrolimus, but it could be pimacrolimus. It could even be chrysoboral probably. It hasn't been studied that way to my knowledge, but very similar concept, a non-steroidal agent to help maintain. And what's fabulous about this is that for the vast majority of patients, you can get them clear, keep them clear safely, and only use those topical steroids intermittently. And I find that many patients then can go into a remission state because they're doing so great. They're like, yeah, now I only have to put a tiny bit of the tacrolimus on my, you know, maybe my arms, a little bit of my arms to keep them from flaring, but I'm barely using any medicine. That to me is a big win. But what if that's not enough? Then we go up to our severe. And that's where we have our final level where we might talk about phototherapy and then our systemic therapies like dupilumab and trilokinumab and our systemic immunosuppressants, cyclosporin, methotrexate, mycophenolate, azathioprine. And as of January this year, our two newest agents on the block are JAK inhibitors, and that's abracitinib and upadacitinib. So for those patients, we really have some big ideas, but we do have to make sure that we've gone through everything carefully. Are we sure they're actually using the medicines? Are we sure there's not an infection or a misdiagnosis? Did we make sure we made, we made sure we tested for contact allergen? And we even consider referrals if we're having that much trouble. In 2017, we got our first biologic agent for atopic dermatitis. And it was an incredible time because 
I had been watching for literally a decade plus as psoriasis had their biologic revolution. Each one was better than the last. They were offering incredible efficacy and really impressive safety beyond anything we had had in the past. And meanwhile, we're sitting here with atopic dermatitis using 50 plus year old medications, trying to hope for the best. All of our systemic agents were technically off label except for prednisone, which has sort of been grandfathered in and is certainly far from ideal. And finally, we got our first biologic, which binds to the IL-4 receptor alpha and thus blocks both IL-4 and IL-13 from binding. And I think that opened the door. We also have people looking at things like IL-31, the master itch cytokine. There's a medication called nemolizumab that's being studied for that. IL-5 blockage, there is a drug called mepolizumab. That one didn't do so well in its trials, but maybe another one will do better. So finally, we're getting some deep insight into how this aspect of the immune system is working. And we're learning that even some of the similar pathways might have individual differences that will help us select against them. And one day we may even be able to figure out exactly which patient would do best in terms of a therapy, not only with efficacy, right? That's important, but also with safety. Jupilumab and trilokinumab are now currently on the market in the United States. Lebrokizumab is hopefully on the way. I think it's, it's been submitted. It's in process. And we can see, although they're kind of the same pathway, broadly speaking, the dupilumab binds to the receptor. Lebri and Trelo bind to the cytokine itself, but they bind in a different location. So there are some differences to these and it may have some clinical ramifications. So they're not truly quote unquote, me too drugs they are not just copies of each other. They really are a little bit different. So part of the excitement is learning about what does that mean for us as clinicians? So let's start with dupilumab. March of 2017 is when it was initially approved for adults. It is now currently approved down to age six years. And there's even data now down to six months of age. So that has actually been submitted to the FDA. And we're going to see if that actually will be approved down to that very young age group. So interestingly, the nomenclature is fascinating. The MAB, so dupilumab means monoclonal antibody. The U in front of it actually means it's fully human. So it's a human antibody when you see Dupil UMAB. And it, again, it binds to IL-4 receptor alpha and thus blocks IL-4 and IL-13. It's injected subcutaneously every two to four weeks, depending on the age and weight. We saw very nice clinical improvement across three age cohorts. And we can see here's, here's our IgA scale. We mentioned that one was used. And this was getting to people, getting the patients clear or almost clear from moderate to severe when they were enrolled. So at 16 weeks to get clear, or almost clear, we can see on the order of 40% of the patients of adults were getting that, I think fairly impressive. In the adolescents, a bit lower, 24%. And then in the children, the pediatric study, around 30% of the patients were clear or almost clear at uh, week 16. So I think that's pretty exciting. It suggests that many patients can have a significant improvement in their skin. Now, here's the newest data that was recently shared and published. And this is looking at the single dose of dupilumab in 40 children aged six months to five years, you know, so just under six years with severe atopic dermatitis, we can see that they reduced the easy score by 44%. And we can see a little bit different response in the older cohort versus the younger cohort, but pretty similar. And it reduced the itch score, the PPNRS numeric rating scale for itch, we can see by 22% and by minus 44% in that older cohort. And we can see in the younger cohort a little bit less impressive, but still quite impressive improvement overall. So I think there's real promise here for this drug, even in our littlest patients, again, for the right patients who need it. And what's so neat is that the safety profile of this medicine is fairly reassuring. It would be remiss to say that it's perfectly safe. That is not true. That is patently false. There are significant safety issues that can happen. But when we compare it to other agents and things we've been using before, it really does have a different level of safety. So as we look through some of the most common side effects really are things like injection site reaction, some of the issues are nasopharyngitis, upper respiratory tract infection. And of course, the conjunctivitis is an issue for our patients. In fact, that's the number one issue that I see with this drug. And that happens in around 10% of adults, maybe a little bit higher in some cohorts. Here, we're looking at some of the pediatric data. So this is lower, actually, even it seems even a little bit lower in the younger patients. But that is a problem for some patients. So this is the quote from the end of that paper. The safety profile of dupilumab in children aged six months to under six years was comparable to that seen in adults, adolescents, and children over six years. There were no dupilumab-related events of serious infection or systemic hypersensitivity. So I think that's a big deal to think about putting it in perspective. 
Now, when we delve into our new monoclonal IL-13 binders, so we have our trilocanumab, that fully human antibody that is binding to IL-13 cytokine directly, and it does affect IL-13's binding to both its receptor alpha-1 and alpha-2, which is sometimes called the decoy or dummy receptor. We don't exactly know what all that means, but we can see here, again, very good separation from the placebo group in both the extra one and extra two trials. And we can see that it is very difficult to compare across different trials because there's other things that are different. But here, the, getting the patients to an IgA score of zero or one, it's numerically a little bit lower than what we saw in the dupilumab trials. Here, it's about 15% in extra one and 22% in extra two. But I caution you not to compare directly because there are other things that can really affect why the number might look the way it does. So I think the key thing is that it was significantly better than placebo. And we can see that as we look at the maintenance of response at 52 weeks, again, it's very reassuring. Many patients were able to maintain that response. And what's remarkable about this medication is they actually studied it as both the two-week, every two-week delivery, which is how you're supposed to start. But then they were able to get it approved that you could space out to every four weeks. So once a month injection, and as you can see here, people going from Q2 weeks to Q4 weeks actually maintained quite a bit of their response at 52 weeks. So this is kind of exciting that for patients who are doing well, you really have the option to space it out in an FDA compliant manner. And I think that's a big deal. And I'm, I applaud that because that gives us as clinicians some flexibility and patients some flexibility. It also gives them a sense that when they're doing better, they're going to need less medicine, which I think just feels great. It sounds great and it feels great. We can see in extra three, a more recent trial. This was published in December of 2021. We can actually see the, this medicine trilocinumab in combination with topical corticosteroids. And again, getting to zero to one is about 38%. And getting to easy 75, so 75% or better, more than half the patients got that 56%. And again, in the longer term follow-up, looking at it for up to 42 months, again, we're seeing very nice durability. So overall, I think there are, there are really very few surprises. Even out many, many months out, we're seeing very good safety and efficacy. And I would argue that it's pretty comparable across all three of these targeted biologics. And here we're looking at lebrokizumab in adults with moderate to severe atopic derm. This is the 2B randomized controlled trial. And again, we see very similar type of an effect, getting patients to the IgA 0 or 1, since that's the one we've been talking about. About 44% of the patients were able to achieve that versus only 15% in the placebo group. So again, a nice robust improvement. And again, safety, I think that is comparable to what we've seen. Now, interestingly, there is a conjunctivitis signal with all of these medications. And one of the questions that's coming up is, is it the same? Is it, you know, is one of them worse than the others or is one better? And I really think the wisest thing to say at this point is we just don't know. You know, it's so early and, and in trials, there are such a relatively small number of people that you can get lucky or unlucky. And I think we won't know uh, until we have a little bit more real world data. My guess is that they're comparable. Yeah, maybe we'll say, hey, this one's a little bit less by a few percentage. That'd be wonderful. That could be a, a real benefit for some patients. But I think that right now we have to say they really do seem quite similar and that anything else, if we read too much into it, it's, it's just not really justifiable. Now, we also know there have been some more recent studies that we're seeing the data coming in. And this, I believe, is this was published as a late breaking abstract at our academy just recently. So I think now we're, we're seeing the data that's going to the FDA that will allow, hopefully, allow this one to be approved. And I think that will be exciting. So there's a lot of buzz about the newest data. Again, fitting in with things we've seen, it does appear very robust, both in terms of safety and efficacy. And there are even other ones. Eblesacabab is another anti-IL-13 receptor, and this also was a late-breaking abstract uh, in 2022, so very recently announced. And again, I think we're seeing this medication uh, very similar to the other ones. It's quite early on, so we, again, it's hard to compare across the trials, but impressive improvements in the easy score versus the placebo dose. So can't wait to see these options. It's going to be very crowded and very confusing for us to think about these. Another one that we mentioned that's a different pathway is blocking IL-31, sometimes called the master itch cytokine. So this is nemolizumab. And this, again, another monoclonal antibody. 
the early data on this from the phase 2A study does show that there really is an improvement in the VAS score, that's the visual analog scale score of itch compared to placebo. So it really does seem to work out, which is kind of neat. And I love the fact that, you know, we had this idea that this was critical for itch and that blocking it really does seem to help with itch. But it also helps with the disease severity and atopic dermatitis. And that was kind of an interesting question. Would it just help with the itch and would their skin look the same or would it help with everything? And it turns out it really does help with disease signs. And it's probably not just mediated through itch. It turns out IL-31, like a lot of things, is probably not as simple as we thought. It does seem to play a more direct role in both inflammation and skin barrier changes. So blocking it really does seem to be an effective approach to helping atopic dermatitis, not only the symptoms, but also the signs. And again, we can see here the easy score. So showing us our, our visual symptoms of atopic derm, much better than placebo. And again, our itch, again, much better than placebo and working very, very rapidly. We're seeing within just days, we're seeing that separate from placebo. So rapid, and that's pretty, pretty exciting stuff. And again, it appears quite safe overall. I would say in line with some of the other biologics we've been talking about. Interestingly though, for this pathway, there does not seem to be any conjunctivitis. So that is very unique, I think, and it really tells us we're not in the same IL-4, IL-13 pathway. We're in somewhere different, and so far, it does look very reassuring. Again, though, this is early data, so we have to be very, very circumspect. We can't make too many big proclamations from such a small number of patients. I really do think this is promising, and it is important to know that we could potentially have a different pathway to offer to patients maybe who didn't do well with an IL-4 or 13. It might not make as much sense to just cycle through those if they had an issue. But it would make some more sense, I think, just philosophically to say, okay, we're going to go a totally different pathway for you. Of course, we're learning also about it in adolescents, not just in adults. And we're seeing, again, a nice improvement in adolescents as well. And I think these are things we anticipate. Of course, we expect this, but it's really important to do the work because you just don't know. You know, a lot of this is still new knowledge and that virtuous cycle of drug development and disease understanding is this is how it gets done. There are also a number of small molecules and specific targets that are being worked out. So I think we may have some new options that'll be oral and not necessarily have to be given by injection because the biologics are very big molecules and those antibodies need to be injected subcutaneously, whereas these can often be taken as a pill or even topically applied. So of course, we have our JAK inhibitor class as well, and those are pretty exciting. In January of this year, we got upadacitinib and abracitinib that helps block JAK1. They're selective for JAK1. And that's part of the signaling cascade for some of the cytokines we've been talking about. IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, they all rely on the JAK-STAT system to send those messages. So it makes sense we can actually block them there. And there are even some topical JAK inhibitors, one of which was released back in September, topical ruxolitinib. So abracitinib has been studied in adults and adolescents. Now, right now, I'll point out it was approved for adults only in the United States. So abracitinib is for 18 and older right now, but this data has been done. And to my understanding, it has been submitted. So it may well be, even by the time you listen to this, that they may have that approval for adolescents as well. We can see a very good response in adolescents as well as adults, which is really exciting. And we can see it was compared in a study called Jade Compare to dupilumab, although I will point out many of the stats folks have told me that it's not, this, this particular setup was not really designed to be a head-to-head -head comparison. The dupilumab group was just another arm. But the point is, I think we can see meaningful itch relief as early as day four. So it seems to be much faster than what we're seeing with dupilumab and on the level of dupilumab, but maybe even more impressive, especially at the higher dose at 200 milligrams, it really does seem to be more potent than dupilumab. And this is true both in adults and adolescents. So I think that's pretty exciting that we can see this. Now, there also has been a study looking at withdrawing the medication and looking what happens over further time. And I think it's important to know this study met its primary and key secondary endpoints. And we're going all the way out to day 281 where we can follow these patients. So we're getting safety and efficacy data over the medium and long term, which is really important for these medicines. It also seems to work in patients who have been having refractory disease to dupilumab. So looking at the group of adult non-responders to dupilumab, it really did seem to help many of those patients. So the way they put it here is a substantial proportion of dupilumab non-responders achieved clinically meaningful efficacy. So I really do think this is probably a great place for both of our JAK inhibitors, those who are not good candidates for biologics, or if they've had an issue with the biologic agent, it would be fantastic.
We also understand that the safety analysis, there are a number of safety issues for these drugs, but overall, when we're looking at our population, I really do think that there are no crazy new safety findings that are being found. And in general, it seems to be a subset that we're seeing of the safety issues in this population. Because of course, we're often talking about the safety of JAK inhibitors as a class. And much of this data has been where JAK inhibitors are, have been used historically, which is in rheumatoid arthritis. So we have a lot more data in that population, although admittedly, that's a different population. And I think part of our job as clinicians is to try to sort through this and figure out what actually applies to the patient in front of us. Now, baricitinib is still waiting. We're not sure if that is going to come out. The FDA has not yet approved it in the U.S., although it is approved in other parts of the world, which is pretty, pretty interesting to see the U.S. being a little bit slow on that one. Upatacitinib did come out at the same time, another oral selective JAK1 inhibitor. And again, we can see there's been a significant reduction in the impact of atopic dermatitis as well as signs and symptoms. We see improved sleep, improvement in daily activities, and emotional state. This really does seem to help very similar, I would say, to the abracitinib data. Again, it's difficult to compare across trials, but there have been a number of network meta-analyses that show they're comparable and perhaps even in favor of upatacitinib. It seems even a little more powerful. So this may be the most powerful medicine that we have for atopic dermatitis. And it also has been studied in adolescents in the United States. It is approved for use in ages 12 and up with moderate to severe uncontrolled atopic dermatitis for patients who have either failed a systemic agent, including biologics, or for whom they're inadvisable. And we know that there also was a very neat study that was a head-to-head -head of upatacitinib versus dupilumab in adults. Now, this was powered to show direct comparison. And I think what we can see here is that the upatacitinib did ultimately outperform the dupilumab, although as we get further along, it becomes a little bit closer. So we also know that the safety profiles are quite different. The upatacitinib being in the JAK inhibitor family has a number of important safety issues, including the black box warning. So we have to make sure our patients really understand some of those issues, including malignancy and major adverse cardiovascular events like heart attack and stroke, and also thrombotic events. So DVTs and pulmonary embolism, of course, in addition to the usual immunosuppressant concept of infection as well. So all of these pieces are important, including the laboratory monitoring. Each one of these is going to go into that discussion with our patients. And ultimately, we have to make that shared decision-making approach because while more powerful, upatacitinib and abracitinib are super powerful and work very fast, they do have some other issues. So like a lot of things in life, I wish there was some easy answer. Now, ICER is very interesting group. They actually have put together a comparison of these medications. And so they are an institute for the economic review of different medicines. And they actually look at these and they did their network meta-analysis, a Bayesian network meta-analysis. And they essentially concluded what we've been alluding to here, that upatacitinib at its highest dose really does seem to be the most powerful. At its lower dose, the 15 milligram, it's probably the second most powerful. And then we have our abracitinib at the high dose being right there with it. And then the abracitinib at the lower dose, 100 milligrams being just below those. And then dupilumab. So we kind of have some Something of a ranking. And it's interesting to think about that. But again, this does not entail the safety issues. So it's a more complicated network of things we have to consider. One of the other key areas that I think has come to the fore in the last few years, but I admit has always been really important, but probably has not received enough of the limelight and emphasis has been disparities in atopic dermatitis. Now, there's no doubt there are healthcare disparities throughout medicine, and there are disparities that are far bigger than what medicine can even try to tackle. But that doesn't excuse the fact that there are important issues that are not only in terms of different ethnic or racial aspects of the diseases, but also some of the socioeconomic issues that go along with it. One of the big things we understand is that in atopic dermatitis, having more richly pigmented skin is really complicated and it brings some other aspects to the disease that we need to make sure that our clinicians are understanding. Everything from making sure that they are appreciating the amount of erythema, because in darker skin, it's harder to appreciate erythema and thus patients can sometimes be underdiagnosed of severity. So that's a big problem. The other issue is that the morphologic presentation can be a little bit different. Darker skin patients sometimes are more likely to present with more perigonodules, more lichenification. And then finally, having more background pigmentation at baseline means that you're probably more susceptible to have pigmentary issues after. And sometimes clinicians will just poo-poo that and say, well, your eczema is better, so who cares? But actually, pigmentary issues are a huge burden for patients. And to patients, sometimes they'll 
they'll look down and say, well, you're saying I'm better, but I don't look better because they still might have a lot of dispigmentation. All of those pieces of the puzzle are important. And I think we as a field have to keep working to do better and better on that, to do better representation, better education. And of course, with the goal of really giving the best possible care to everybody who comes in. So that wraps us up. The past 50 years had been really quiet for atopic dermatitis. All we heard was crickets, but that does not seem to be what's going on now. We are in an incredible golden age with all sorts of new ideas, not only new treatments, but the treatments that are informing our understanding of the disease. And there's no doubt that biologics and these JAK inhibitors have revolutionized the treatment of atopic dermatitis and helped us be able to help our patients better than ever before. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to seeing everybody soon. So we have to put alopecia areata in the context of hair loss disorders. Male pattern alopecia is for sure the most common form of hair loss, but alopecia areata is the second most common form of hair loss. And of course, there is central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, less commonly seen, but not that uncommon in our black patients. And so I would say, that we need to be very considerate of the differential diagnosis in particular in patients of skin of color and be sure of what we're treating. There's frontal fibrosing, alopecia, and discoid lupus erythematosus as well. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list of alopecias, but ones that we really need to be aware of when we are examining any patient with hair loss. Usually, alopecia areata is a clinical diagnosis. The patient that presents with sudden development of one or more patches of hair loss or reports a history of such patches coming and going, we don't have to go any further. We know the diagnosis. Sometimes, however, the clinical picture and history are not enough. In these cases, other clues can be helpful. And in these cases, we're going to look for exclamation mark hairs or yellow globules on dermoscopy, especially if you have somebody with more diffuse alopecia areata. Then if somebody has a rapid onset of shedding or an unusual pattern, or you want to rule out scarring alopecia, a biopsy can be helpful. Most of us remember from our derm path training as residents, the swarm of bees referring to the lymphocytic infiltrate around the hair bulb. Now regarding the epidemiology of alopecia areata, The lifetime prevalence is about 2%, which means that there may be as many as 7 million people in the U.S. who have alopecia areata, and there may be as many as 160 million people worldwide with the disease. Males and females are similarly affected. The onset is typically in the first four decades of life, but disease onset can happen in any decade of life, and it is the same disease when it occurs in a 70-year-old for the first time as it is in the seven-year-old. And lastly, there's no known racial predominance. The question of healthcare access and disparities is a tricky one. There are, I think, in the case of alopecia areata, there are two parts. One, it's access. You know, can you get in to see a dermatologist? And then two, how comfortable is that dermatologist with evaluating and treating hair loss? And so, I don't think that there is something in particular about any race in terms of alopecia areata, but to the extent that some groups may have less access to a dermatologist that will affect their access to effective therapy, at least for severe disease. The clinical spectrum of alopecia areata is broad. The most common presentation is patchy disease, one or a few quarter size patches. And of course, that patchy pattern can be more exuberant, though less commonly. We recognize ophiasis pattern, which is pretty common. Only rarely will we see Sisypho pattern or the inverse pattern of ophiasis, which is predominantly top of the scalp involvement with hair loss. We will rarely see diffuse pattern alopecia areata as well. In Sisypho pattern and diffuse pattern alopecia areata, you might think to do a biopsy to be confident of the diagnosis because they can mimic clinically male pattern or female pattern hair loss respectively. 
And then, of course, there's the most severe disease where people have near complete or complete scalp hair loss. Of course, any hair bearing site can be involved. And so eyebrows can be involved. Eyelashes can be involved. These can be involved separately or there can be involvement of both eyebrows and eyelashes. And of course, the beard can be involved in males and the nails being another keratinized structure can also be involved, in which case you see nail pitting or ridging, nail dystrophy or onychomedesis or onycholysis as well. The risk factors for alopecia areata are genetics, genetics, genetics. About 20% of patients with alopecia areata can identify a family member who also has the disease. In 2010, there was the seminal genome-wide association study published, and this showed that there were about 18 genes found in association with alopecia areata. And ultimately, the complex polygenic nature of disease underlies why the concordance among monozygotic twins is only about 55%. Thinking about the comorbidities of alopecia areata, there are many and they are common. Autoimmune thyroid disease occurs more than twice as often in patients with alopecia areata as the general population. This means that 20 to 30% of our patients with alopecia areata have autoimmune thyroid disease. Similarly, atopic dermatitis occurs more than twice as often in patients with alopecia areata as the general population. Again, this means that 20 to 30% of our patients with alopecia areata will have atopic dermatitis. This, of course, means that atopy in general is more common in patients with alopecia areata. And I like to think about these autoimmune and inflammatory comorbidities in terms of a Venn diagram in which the co-occurrence of these disease is likely related to shared genetics and immune pathways. And this circles back to the genome-wide association study, which showed 18 genes in association with alopecia areata, many of which have been found to be associated with other autoimmune diseases. Thinking about the impact of alopecia areata, many of our patients have been told, and maybe we've said ourselves to patients, at least you don't have cancer, it's just hair, right? So the psychosocial impact of alopecia areata has been documented in study after study. In one study, 62% of surveyed patients reported making major life decisions, such as relationships or career choices related to alopecia areata. 85% of patients stated coping with alopecia areata as a daily challenge and 47% of patients reported anxiety and or depression. And indeed, the lifetime prevalence of depression and anxiety in other studies has been reported in up to 39% of patients. And so there's real psychiatric comorbidity in addition to psychosocial impact of disease. And why is this? Underlying this impact is that hair matters whether we think about the depiction of severe hair loss in TV and cinema, in which we see commonly that villains and aliens are frequently depicted with severe hair loss, or we just think about our instinctive response to people who have severe hair loss. These people are commonly thought to have cancer and are undergoing chemotherapy. The billboard by the side of the road, the mailer that shows up ever so often showing the child with no hair immediately makes all of us think that we are about to see a solicitation for a children's cancer center. Again, it's sort of deeply ingrained that we recognize severe hair loss as being sickness. 
the stigma of hair loss was recently very well documented in a survey of over 2,000 people. In this survey, individuals were shown three images of the same person with varying degrees of hair loss. And 30% of respondents reported that the face with no hair, no scalp hair, no eyebrows, and no eyelashes, respondents reported seeing these people as sick. And 20% of respondents perceived the individuals with severe hair loss as unattractive. The health-related quality of life can be documented in numerous ways using different instruments, thinking about the Dermatology Life Quality Index or the DLQI. In a study of alopecia areata patients, we see values that are similar to DLQI values in another study of patients with psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. I think this calls out that if we don't hesitate at all to treat patients with psoriasis or atopic dermatitis with systemic therapies, we should not hesitate to treat our patients with alopecia areata with systemic therapies. So now the assessment of patients with alopecia areata. This is going to be really important to us in a world of new therapies. We're going to have to be able to segment patients into categories of mild, moderate, and severe to understand who needs what treatments. So how do we assess disease severity in alopecia areata? Thinking about the clinical spectrum of disease, which is so broad, ranging from a single patch of hair loss to numerous patches of hair loss to complete scalp involvement with or without involvement of eyebrows, eyelashes, beard in males, and then body hair involvement, the fact that nails can be involved. How do we begin to assess severity in a disease with so many presentations? So one way to think about disease severity is to focus on the scalp and the amount of scalp hair loss. We can assess amount of scalp hair loss using the severity of alopecia tool or SALT score. This takes some practice. Indeed, this is the common tool used to assess amount of scalp hair loss in clinical trials but may take some practice and may be a little less friendly in regular clinical practice. And so it may be easier to just put people into buckets of amount of scalp hair loss, such as can be done with the alopecia areata IGA or investigative global assessment. Using this tool, we are going to think about somebody having no scalp hair loss versus 1 to 20% scalp hair loss, 21 to 49% scalp hair loss, that being moderate disease, 50 to 94% scalp hair loss, that being severe disease, and to separate patients with severe disease from the most severe disease we have another category of 95 to 100% scalp hair loss. And so again, this is a little bit easier than the SALT score because in this method, we're going to take all of somebody's individual patches and move them around to fill, say, the right or left quadrant, which would be approximately 20% scalp hair loss, or we're going to move them around to fit them into half of the scalp which would be somebody with moderate disease. And then obviously for more severe presentations, it would be very easy to put somebody into that severe bucket or very severe bucket. But thinking only about scalp hair loss is a fairly monochromatic view of disease. And thinking about the broad presentation of alopecia areata, we want to be able to take account of patients with other hair bearing site involvement or psychosocial impairment related to the disease. And to this end, a group of alopecia areata experts recently convened an eDelphi process to develop what's called the alopecia areata scale or the ASK. And in this tool, we are going to anchor disease severity, at least initially, in the amount of scalp hair loss. 
So somebody with less than or equal to 20% scalp hair loss is going to have mild disease. Somebody with 21 to 49% scalp hair loss will have moderate disease. And somebody with 50 to 100% scalp hair loss will have severe disease. But the idea is that if somebody has noticeable involvement of eyebrows or eyelashes, then we can take somebody in the mild category related to scalp hair loss and bump them up to moderate disease severity. Or similarly, somebody with an inadequate response after at least six months of treatment and having 21 to 49% scalp hair loss or moderate disease can be bumped up to severe disease based on the refractoriness to treatment. And similarly, a diffuse multifocal positive hair pull test consistent with rapidly progressive alopecia areata or a negative impact on psychosocial functioning resulting from alopecia areata similarly can upgrade somebody from mild to moderate disease or moderate to severe disease. Now let's dive into pathogenesis and treatment. Our understanding of alopecia areata pathogenesis has evolved dramatically. Since at least the mid-1900s, alopecia areata was said to be caused by stress, an idea that continues to be perpetuated today. Then in 1982, we learned that the hair bulb was surrounded by a lymphocytic infiltrate, the first clue to the inflammatory or autoimmune nature of alopecia areata. So thinking of this as being an inflammatory disease mediated by lymphocytes, it is not surprising to see that even up until 2010, treatment algorithms for alopecia areata were comprised predominantly of agents that targeted immune cells, such as intralesional corticosteroids, topical corticosteroids, topical immunotherapy, and then even topical minoxidil, the mechanism of which we don't quite understand. And then for more severe disease, we see algorithms employing systemic corticosteroids, cyclosporin, methotrexate, and other conventional systemic immunosuppressants. Thinking about corticosteroids, we have topical corticosteroids and intralesional corticosteroids, and then we also have systemic corticosteroids such as dexamethasone. Intralesional corticosteroids are for sure the mainstay of therapy for limited hair loss. There's some data to support potent topical corticosteroids for treatment of this disease, and then there is, again, data that we'll come around to for systemic corticosteroids as well. Thinking about minoxidil, a vasodilator, there is some data to support its use as a topical for the treatment of limited hair loss in alopecia areata. There's actually also some data from the 1980s showing that oral minoxidil can be effective in a small percent of patients with severe alopecia areata. Thinking about immunotherapy, in particular SADB or DPCP, the exact mechanism of action of these agents is unknown, but for sure there is a role for immunotherapy in the treatment of patients with limited hair loss. When is systemic treatment needed? I think the best way to conceptualize this is to think about how we use intralesional triamcinolone, the mainstay of therapy for limited scalp hair loss. The best way to administer intralesional triamcinolone is to give an injection every one centimeter. If you think about the hair bearing surface area of the scalp, it is about 700 square centimeters, which means that 1% of the scalp surface area is about 7 square centimeters, which is approximately the projection of one's thumb onto the scalp. And so now you can imagine what the average patch of hair loss is in terms of square centimeters. So thinking about somebody with 10% scalp hair loss, this means that person needs about 35 or more injections of intralesional triamcinolone. The patient with 20% scalp hair loss needs 70 or more injections. 
which is really hard to tolerate, especially considering that we do this repeatedly on a monthly basis for two or three or four or five or more cycles. And so thinking about intralesional triamcinolone, I think we can arrive at the concept that alopecia areata involving greater than 20% of the scalp surface area merits systemic therapy. So what are the systemic therapies that we have in our toolbox? As we pointed out earlier, these include systemic corticosteroids, cyclosporin, methotrexate, and other conventional systemic immunosuppressants. Thinking about systemic corticosteroids, there are different ways to administer them. Some people administer them daily for months, and it is thought by others that doing pulsed corticosteroids is a bit safer. Thinking about a study for the use of oral dexamethasone for the treatment of adult patients with alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis, in this study of 31 patients given oral dexamethasone, on average, about eight milligrams per day for two consecutive days every single week, week after week, month after month, there was a good response, meaning 75% or more scalp hair regrowth in about 71% of patients over a period on average of about a year. And so we see that we have to administer this medicine for long periods of time in order to get hair regrowth. And I think the question arises, do we think that this is safe long-term, given that patients with chronic disease or given that patients with severe disease often have chronic disease, do we want to be using relatively high-dose corticosteroids, even in a pulsed fashion, for months and months or longer? Thinking about other systemic agents, there is a very interesting retrospective study published in the last two years. In this study, the rates of response to cyclosporin, methotrexate, and azathioprine are highlighted. And what we see using a definition of response as simply somebody who continued therapy for 12 months or longer, again, with no mention of an amount of scalp hair regrowth, we see that up to two-thirds of patients treated with cyclosporin, methotrexate, or azathioprine need concomitant systemic corticosteroids in order to achieve this definition of response. And so I really think that this data between the systemic corticosteroids data and then understanding that steroid sparing agents can rarely be used as monotherapy but need concomitant systemic corticosteroids, we have that there's tremendous unmet need for the treatment of severe alopecia areata. So let's think about emerging therapies for alopecia areata. And in particular, let's put them in the context or develop emerging therapies based on an evolving understanding of disease pathogenesis. So more than 30 years after the discovery of the peri bar inflammatory infiltrate, the genome-wide association study implicated innate and adaptive immunity in AA pathogenesis. And this work was followed shortly thereafter with work describing the interaction of follicular epithelial cells of the hair bulb and cytotoxic T cells. So at last, an explanation for the swarm of bees. In this model of alopecia areata, the peribulbar lymphocytic infiltrate is driven by interferon gamma and the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-15. What happens is that IL-15 is secreted by follicular epithelial cells and recruits and activates cytotoxic T cells. And those cytotoxic T cells in turn secrete interferon gamma, which has a receptor on follicular epithelial cells, activating follicular epithelial cells to secrete more IL-15. And you get cyclical action, which leads to inflammation and eventually hair loss. Looking closely at this model of alopecia areata pathogenesis, we see an opportunity to interrupt disease, that is, an opportunity to make hair grow back. 
both IL-15 and interferon gamma signal through the JAK-STAT pathway. And so the relay race starting with either IL-15 binding of its receptor on T cells or interferon gamma binding of its receptor on follicular epithelial cells that leads to JAK protein activation and eventually gene transcription and disease can be interrupted with a class of medicines called JAK inhibitors. So what is the JAK-STAT pathway? Shown here is the cross-section of a generic cell. This can be a keratinocyte or a T cell. And what happens is that a cytokine binds its unique cell surface receptor, activating that receptor, which in turn activates jack proteins on the intracellular side of the receptor. Jack proteins in turn activate stat proteins, and activated stat proteins migrate to the nucleus where gene transcription happens and disease follows. And so I think of this as a relay race from the outside of the cell to the nucleus. And we want to stop this relay race because when we stop it, disease gets better. So we see that there is an opportunity to interrupt this relay race with a small molecule inhibitor of JAK proteins called JAK inhibitors. So thinking about the cytokines that mediate alopecia areata, IL-15, and interferon gamma, these cytokines signal through, in the case of interferon gamma, JAK1 and JAK2, and in the case of IL-15, JAK1 and JAK3. And so we have a reason to use a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, or a JAK3 inhibitor for treatment of disease. What does that look like? Shown here is the first patient with alopecia areata treated with a JAK inhibitor to regrow hair. He had severe alopecia areata and psoriasis, and I treated him with a JAK inhibitor tovacitinib. He had a remarkable reversal of disease, growing all of his hair back over eight months. That case report was followed by open label trials, case series, and case reports of off label use of JAK inhibitors. Many of those are shown here, but this is far from an exhaustive list. The literature now for off-label use of JAK inhibitors is quite extensive. The before and after photos are so compelling, and indeed, I think we can all understand how life-changing it is for patients with severe disease to have an opportunity to grow their hair back and achieve wellness. It is exciting to think that in only eight years, we have gone from off-label use of JAK inhibitors to multiple clinical trials of JAK inhibitors for alopecia areata. And let's discuss the results of these clinical trials. I'm hopeful that this is the future of treatment of this disease. In order to understand the results of clinical trials in alopecia areata, we first need to understand the endpoints or the way success is measured. Briefly, the severity of alopecia tool or SALT is an instrument to assess the amount of scalp hair loss in a patient. The SALT score ranges from zero or no scalp hair loss to 100 or 100% 100 scalp hair loss. In the trials we are going to discuss, patients had a minimum of 50% scalp hair loss and often had complete scalp hair loss at baseline. What we want to see is either big percent changes in baseline SALT scores or attainment of very low absolute SALT scores at the end of treatment. In a phase two trial of the topical JAK inhibitor, ruxolitinib, 1.5% cream, about 5% of patients achieved 90% scalp hair regrowth over 24 weeks of treatment. And so it seems that ruxolitinib, 1.5% cream, is ineffective for the treatment of severe alopecia areata. In another recently published clinical trial, the topical JAK inhibitor delgocitinib ointment failed to grow hair in patients with alopecia areata. And so I really think that it is fair to conclude at this moment in time that at least for severe disease, topical JAK inhibitors are ineffective for the treatment of alopecia areata. Now, let's think about oral JAK inhibitors, starting with duruxolitinib. This is phase two clinical trial data. And in this trial, we see that 75% scalp hair regrowth is achieved in 29 to 42% of patients at the two highest doses of duruxolitinib over 24 weeks of treatment. 
Now, in two phase three trials of the oral JAK inhibitor, baricitinib, 17 to 35% of patients achieved an absolute SALT score of 20 or less, meaning 20% or less scalp hair loss, over 36 weeks of treatment with baricitinib 2 milligrams or 4 milligrams, respectively. In the baricitinib trial, patients with eyebrows and eyelashes loss at baseline demonstrated regrowth of eyebrows and eyelashes at similar rates as scalp hair regrowth in the trials. A recent integrated safety analysis of baricitinib from the two clinical trials shows safety consistent with the known profile of baricitinib, and at periods of time out to 52 weeks, we see a safety profile similar to what is seen in the 36-week randomized double-blind placebo-controlled portion of the trial. Now, in a phase three trial of the oral JAK inhibitor ritlocitinib in patients down to age 12, and so this is the first clinical trial in alopecia areata involving adolescents, we have 20% to 30% of patients achieving an absolute SALT score of 20 or less, meaning 20% or less scalp hair loss over 24 weeks of treatment at different doses of ritlocitinib. These numbers climb to 30% to 40% of patients achieving this low amount of scalp hair loss over an additional 24 weeks of treatment. In the ritlocitinib trial, patients with eyebrows and eyelashes loss at baseline demonstrated regrowth of eyebrows and eyelashes at similar rates as scalp hair regrowth. The safety profile of ritlocitinib over the 48 weeks is consistent with the known safety profile of JAK inhibitors there were a small number of serious infections. There was one pulmonary embolism. There were two malignancies, and there were some cases of herpes zoster. So the question arises, when can treatment be stopped? I think because we are so accustomed to thinking about alopecia areata in terms of the waxing and waning disease that is frequently seen with mild forms of alopecia areata that we end up thinking that all of alopecia areata waxes and wanes. But indeed, in moderate to severe cases of hair loss, hair loss is chronic and spontaneous remission is uncommon. And so since we're thinking about the use of JAK inhibitors for treatment of patients with more severe hair loss, I think that we should be thinking about treatment as being chronic. And indeed, the limited amount of data that we have from clinical trials to date suggests that over a period of 4 to 16 weeks after stopping JAK inhibitors, hair loss recurs. So now thinking about an alopecia areata treatment algorithm, we're going to divide the spectrum of disease according to limited hair loss and then more severe hair loss. And of course, we're going to treat the patients with limited hair loss with intralesional corticosteroids or topical corticosteroids. We will use topical immunotherapy in some of these patients. But for patients with more severe hair loss, we're going to advance to systemic therapies. And here, I think, especially in the category of severe alopecia areata, the overwhelming data is for JAK inhibitors. And I think that these will eventually be first-line therapy. But of course, we have the other systemic immunosuppressants that we discussed, and these can be used as well. So thinking about autoimmune thyroid disease and atopic dermatitis, both of which frequently co-occur with alopecia areata, it's not surprising that alopecia areata is not uncommonly associated with polyautoimmunity, which is simply the presence of more than one autoimmune disease in a single patient. Because shared genetics and immune pathways likely explain this co-occurrence of disease, it's interesting to think about JAK inhibitors for the treatment of patients with alopecia areata and comorbid autoimmune and inflammatory disease. It's interesting to consider that JAK inhibitors are showing efficacy across a broad range of autoimmune diseases, including psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, vitiligo, inflammatory bowel disease, atopic dermatitis, and even in lupus, 
And so thinking about our patients with alopecia areata and polyautoimmunity, it may be that we should be thinking about treatment of them with JAK inhibitors. In one small retrospective study, I treated several patients with alopecia areata who also had inflammatory bowel disease with off-label tofacitinib, and many of them achieved scalp hair regrowth and suppression of their comorbid inflammatory bowel disease with tofacitinib monotherapy. And so in conclusion, alopecia areata is a complex polygenic autoimmune disease and is often associated with polyautoimmunity and inflammatory disease. The quality of life impairment in alopecia areata is significant and similar to, if not greater than that, seen in psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. Intralesional corticosteroids are the mainstay of therapy for adults with mild disease, that is less than 20% scalp hair loss, but for moderate to severe alopecia areata, systemic therapy is warranted. The immunopathogenesis of alopecia areata involves IL-15 and interferon. The immunopathogenesis of alopecia areata involves IL-15 and interferon gamma, which signal through the JAK-STAT pathway. And lastly, JAK inhibitors are showing promise in clinical trials for alopecia areata, and I think they really represent the future treatment of our patients with severe disease. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TJZ860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer.